Dr. B.F. Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University, has authored such important scientific books as The Behavior of Organisms, Verbal Behavior, The Technology of Teaching, and Contingencies of Reinforcement. In addition, he has written two books of general interest, which have been both widely received and highly controversial, the novel Walden II and Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Included in the many scientific awards bestowed upon him are the Distinguished Scientific Award of the American Psychological Association, membership in the National Academy of Sciences, and the President's Medal of Science. In this film, Dr. Skinner addresses himself to some of the most important issues facing education today. With Dr. Skinner is Dr. John M. Whiteley of Washington University, St. Louis. The issues of freedom and control are among the most misunderstood of your work. I would like to provide the learning behaviors of two children by way of example. One child's learning behavior is characterized by excessive dependence on the teacher at every stage of doing an assignment. The other child's learning behavior is characterized by an independence, an apparent love of learning on its own, a self-starting. Which child is the more free and which child is the more controlled? You see, you have... You phrased the question by referring to one child as dependent on the teacher and the other child is independent. He is independent of the teacher, but he's not independent of the natural world. He has already come under the control of the physical environment which interests him. Uh, Rousseau raised this question 200 years ago. Rousseau didn't like personal dependence. He thought people uh, harmed natural goodness. So he wanted everyone to be dependent on things. But that's the point. That you are dependent on the physical environment just as much as you are dependent on people. I think it, we would agree, I believe, that the child who is exploring uh, the real world around him is, is farther advanced than the child who has to run to the teacher for approval. And uh, the teacher, if, if he's any good, will make sure that, that child shifts his, his dependency to the world of things Otherwise, the teacher would remain essential, and that you don't want. The, every teacher has to wean uh, the student, just as every therapist has to wean his client. You have to, get, you have to break up these dependencies. However, if a child is really not getting much reinforcement out of life, then a little parental or, uh, or instructional approval will be enough to get the child going. But that should be withdrawn. You should, you should break down the control exercised by another person and play up the control exercised by the, the environment. But there's no freedom involved in either case. The child will, will feel free in both cases. In one case, he's free to go and ask the teacher if this is good, and the teacher says yes. In another case, he's free to try something new and something interesting happens. But, uh, and he feels free. But actually, he, in one case, he's still under the control of personal approval. In the other case, he has come under the control of all of the interesting things that happen in the world at large when you, when you uh, begin to explore it. You've written that our educational environments are defective. How would teachers within this environment go about helping the child modify his learning behavior? Well, you have to do it, first of all, by constructing the kind of environment <clears throat> that will, will bring the child under some kind of control. If you go into a disrupted classroom where the kids are late in arriving and they run around the room and so on, the teacher may be completely out of control there. What you have to do is to set up some very conspicuous rewarding or reinforcing contingencies. And you can do it with, with by tokens or with credit points or with personal approval or something of that kind. Make sure that the child is reinforced for coming to school sitting down, getting to work, and learning something. Now, you may have to make it very explicit to begin with, something as conspicuous as a, a, a token that he can pocket in exchange for something at lunch or something like that. But you don't want that to go on forever. You don't want uh, kids to uh, live their lives just to collect tokens any more than we want people to live their lives just collecting money. It's something else again. 
But you can then change from a token system to a credit system, from a credit system just to a bit of approval, a pat on the back, but then you want to get rid of that also and have the, the, the child come under the control of the instructional materials he's working with. Now, I don't think you're going to do that by finding things that are naturally interesting to the child. There are naturally interesting things, but the child is there to learn behaviors which will pay off naturally only much later in his life. For example, beginning reading is not very re rewarding. Uh, you can put four color pictures on every page of, the, of, the, of your reader and that kind of thing, but there are ways in which you can work out contingency so the child is successful very quickly. In, 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 it may be quite arbitrary. You may get some feedback that this is the correct name for that object and so on. And, but with these spurious contingencies, call them anything you like, you can begin to build up fluent reading behavior, and then the child will begin to get reinforced, as we all are, from reading enjoyable things. But you can't move to the enjoyable things immediately because they, they aren't enjoyable. He hasn't acquired enough behavior to read in, enjoyably. So you set up artificial uh, contingencies, which might be just approval, but could be much better than that, to build the behaviors, which then come under the control of, of the natural contingencies built into books. We read books for the rewarding things that happen when we read. And you can't start there, but that's where you want the child to move as fast as possible. What are the range of positive reinforcers open to a school? It seems to me schools are operating in a very different way than the one you just described. Yes. That, uh, that when you ask yourself as a teacher, as I have at the college level, what have I got that my students want? Uh, it's sometimes a pretty discouraging uh, question. But you can uh, discover things which will be reinforcing to students at any level. And that has been done. A great deal of progress has been made. There are things in an ordinary, uh, even if, say a ghetto classroom, lower grades or high school, that can be used as reinforcers. Um, you can have special foods at lunchtime, uh, access to play space, uh, privileges to associate with, with other kids of your choice. Uh, more and more of these things are, have been brought into play as, as the kinds of contrived reinforcers that can be used temporarily to get the kinds of behavior which will then eventually have their own natural consequences which will be reinforcing. That, that can be done. Uh, fortunately for us all, the human organism is reinforced just for being successful with something. And that has had survival value, and it can be used. If you design instructional materials properly, and I would say that programmed instruction is an example, then mere progress is, is, is reinforcing. What do you mean that programmed instruction is designed properly? Well, I mean good programs in which the response you make uh, demands something from you. It's not too easy, but it's still almost always right. And as a result of having made that, you were then able to go on and do something else that you couldn't do before. A, a good instructional program has some built-in reinforcers. If you just leaf through toward the back of the book and see what you don't know, and it's always obvious you don't know it, and then you look back and see what you've covered, and you do know that. That's obvious that something is happening. You're making progress, and before you know it, you know the whole, uh, you know the whole program. And fortunately for us all, the human organism is reinforced by, by successful accomplishment. So on a stage-to-stage -stage basis through this program text, you're rewarded as you go on. It would seem to me, however, that our educational environments are designed very differently, typically. For example, it, you're punished if you don't do well. Right. The school rewards uh, its best rewards for those people who accomplish the most. But almost by definition within it, there can only be a few at the top. And children aren't rewarded on a on a day-to-day -day basis for accomplishing as right. much as they can. Well, there are all sorts of things wrong with the contingencies which now prevail. And I want to get away from them just as much as, say, the free school people do. But I think they're going the wrong way. They're not going to be able to get away from these. They always fall back on them eventually. No, you're quite right. It, all the way up through, even through graduate school, the average student studies to avoid the consequences of not studying. Consequences, which can